So thank you everyone uh, for joining. I'm very happy to see you here and I'm very happy to see our speaker, Richard Perlman. So thank you, Richard. And uh, Richard is the creator of the Rock Programming Language, programming language that started in 2018 based on his experience as a core contributor to Elm, a program that you may be familiar with. And uh, among other things, uh, he is the author of a book on Elm uh, published with Manning, if I'm correct. And uh, we will learn today about rock and the specificity of the language. And in the introduction that you have received by emails, you can read a lot of uh, technical terms giving you a bit more details uh, on this language. But the main concept that I think is important to stress in this introduction is that ROC uh, is a uh, uh, pure functional language and it has a focus on performance. So uh, in some areas it has better performance already than established languages like uh, uh, Java, JavaScript, or Go. And so I think that Richard is going to explain to us today how he was able to achieve this impressive result. So thank you very much, uh, Richard. Now I will uh, shut up and let you take over. I will just uh, remember how this works, especially for people joining us for the first time. Uh, if you have uh, questions, you can unmute yourself. If you are shy, just write your question in the chat and I will uh, interrupt uh, Richard trying to find the right moment and read your question to you. So thank you, Richard. And you can start whenever you want. Okay, thank you so much. Let me uh, share my screen. Everybody see okay? All right, great. This is uh, Rock, Outperforming Imperative with Pure Functional Programming. I'm Richard Feldman. Um, so basically, we're going to break this sort of down into four sections. Um, first, going to talk about motivation, then uh, embedding, like one of the use cases for Rock, then performance, uh, which is kind of the, the focus here. And then finally, uh, talk a little bit about the editor plans that we have in the future. Uh, so let's start with motivation. So basically, uh, I'm a big fan of the Elm programming language. Uh, I've used it for uh, a long time. It's been my favorite programming language for a long time. Um, and Elm is basically a language that is, it's a pure functional programming language. Uh, it's a, a simple language. It's sort of focused on this like delightful user experience. Um, and it's a compiled to JavaScript language. So I love using Elm for that when I'm like uh, building UIs in the browser. But of course, there are lots of other use cases. Um, and so I created Rock to be a similarly sort of simple and pure functional language that's focused on creating a delightful experience. But instead of compiling to JavaScript, it compiles to binary like machine code. Um, and so you can use it for a variety of use cases that I, I couldn't use Elm for. Um, so some of those specific use cases include uh, like web servers, command line apps, uh, native UIs. Um, those are kind of like the, the sort of big use cases, but there's actually a sort of a long tail of other domains that I'm interested in with Rock. Um, for example, like writing editor plugins, like for Vim or something like that. Um, uh, database extensions, basically the, the types of things that you might use something like Lua for. Um, also embedding into an existing code base. Um, so my, at my previous job, No Red Ink, we, uh, we used uh, Elm on the front end and then we were increasingly using Haskell on the back end. But because we had a big legacy Ruby on Rails code base, we found a lot of challenges around trying to incrementally migrate uh, from Ruby to Haskell because uh, Haskell's not sort of designed to be uh, easily embeddable in other languages. And so one of the things that I wanted uh, Rock to be good at is to be able to be embedded inside of another language where you can sort of uh, like call it pretty easily from another language so that you can incrementally transition to it um, or just use it for like uh, plugins or scripting inside of like a game engine or something like that. We'll talk more about these uh, specific use cases a little bit later on. Um, some of the sort of features of Rock, uh, it's got a sound type system. Uh, so no null, no any, uh, none of that stuff. Um, principal decidable type inference. So 100% type inference across the board. Um, structural product types and structural sum types. Um, talk a little bit more about those later. Uh, and also parametric polymorphism as well as ad hoc polymorphism. Um, not going to get into too much details about these, but these are kind of like commonly asked questions <laughs> from uh, a crowd of people who like to do uh, programming language design like this group. Um, so I figured I'd just sort of uh, mention those briefly and then we can, you know, ask questions about them later. Um, 
some of the things that are really important to me about Rock, uh, one is that the compiler is really fast. Um, so the, the language is designed to, to, to be able to support fast compilation. And we've really spent a lot of time making the compiler go as fast as we can. Um, also fast runtime performance, definitely going to talk uh, in a good bit of detail about that later. Um, helpful compiler error messages. I'll give a brief example of what I mean by that. Um, a sort of from a language design perspective, having a small number of simple language primitives. Um, and also finally being able to be easy to embed rock in uh, existing code. And once we get through the performance section, you'll kind of see why uh, why it's able to do that. Um, so let's get a little bit more specific about fast compilation. Um, so the rock compiler is written in Rust. Uh, this is not the sort of language where we have like a spec and there's multiple compilers. It's just like there's just one implementation, uh, at least today. And you know maybe someday someone else will implement it, but there's really kind of no plans for that. Um, also, uh, we don't plan to uh, ever self-host the compiler. Like we want it to stay in Rust because we want it to have absolute, like the maximum amount of control over compiler for performance that we possibly can and rewriting in a language that has automatic memory management like Rock, even as fast as Rock is, would slow down the compiler some amount and we don't want to do that. Um, so uh, we do a lot of like interning inside the compilers, like uh, not just of identifiers, but also even things like uh, layouts when we get to code generation. Um, we follow like data oriented design in a number of areas. Um, Andrew Kelly, who's the author of the Zig programming language, um, gave a really nice talk about that at Handmade Seattle a couple of years ago. And we really kind of took that to heart as a way to speed up the compiler. And we've seen some really nice speed improvements um, from doing stuff like uh, structive arrays and things like that. Um, we, uh, we have a work in progress uh, custom surgical linker. It's work in progress in that uh, it actually works and is the default linker that we use on um, Linux as well as Windows. Uh, we don't have it working on Mac OS and there's also certain uh, sort of like less common use cases that it doesn't support yet. Um, but this is also like really important because without this thing, like link times were, were really uh, expensive, but with it, they're, they're pretty fast. Um, we also have uh, different backends, like I'm going to talk about um, for the performance section, we're going to talk about our LLVM backend, which, uh, you know, LLVM is really good at creating optimized code, but it doesn't run very fast. Um, so for development, like if you're doing local development, you don't really care about optimization, you just want your code to build fast. Um, we have alternative backends to LLVM. So going straight to x86 machine code, going straight to ARM machine code, um, and also going straight to WebAssembly. Um, these are in various states of work in progress. The WebAssembly one is very nearly done. Uh, everything but 128-bit integers are supported, <laughs> uh, but the others are, are in like uh, lesser states of completeness, at least today. Um, so putting all this together, uh, here's like a, a very simple benchmark that we did of just like, you know, how long does it take to compile and run Hello World uh, in, a, in a few different programming languages? Um, so C++ took a little under 300 milliseconds. Um, then at the extreme opposite end of the spectrum, we had cat, like the command line utility cat, um, which we consider to be basically unbeatable because it's basically just like cat hello.txt. Um, I don't know of any programming language that's going to, <laughs> that's going to beat that. Um, but uh, Python was was a little bit slower than CAD, but obviously quite a bit faster than C++. Um, Rust was a little bit faster than C++, but, but not by much. Um, Go was a lot faster than that. Clang was like way faster than Go, um, which was interesting to see, like just compiling C versus C++, even though they were both very simple, you know, hello world type programs. Um, JavaScript uh, on, on Node.js is a little bit faster than Clang, and then Rock was uh, somewhere in between Node.js and Python. Um, so we're, we're pretty happy with this result. Um, we'd like to catch up with Python if we can. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, I mean, uh, you know, compared to like JS and Python, Rock is doing like full type checking, type inference, and compiling to machine code, whereas JavaScript and Python are just like executing on a virtual machine, not doing any type checking, et cetera. Um, uh, so helpful error messages. Um, so uh, I want to just give like a quick sort of before and after of an example of like uh, the, the types of things like that we like to improve in order to try and make the error messages more helpful. So this was uh, a rock error message that I ran into when I was uh, working on something. And uh, I, I have it sort of zoomed out. You can't really see what the error message is. I'm going to zoom in, in a second. But like it's 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 a really long error because uh, basically I had a type mismatch involving two fields within uh, two different records. And both of the records had a whole bunch of fields in them. Um, so, you know, the, the before diff was like, this, this is what the error message looked like when I ran into it. Um, and even if I zoom in, you can see it says, okay, type mismatch. This second argument to map has an unexpected type. So it's now, you know, it's nice that it like underlines it in red and, and sort of shows me the line number and everything. And it says, okay, this convert types to file value is a, and then it shows me this gigantic record type. And then, uh, down at the bottom of the screenshot says, but map needs its second argument to be this other record. Um, 
So this is an example of my encountering a what I would consider to be a not very helpful error message because I mean as it turned out later only two of the fields between these two difference were uh, these two records were um, different but I couldn't really see that from looking at the error message so uh, this is the after so I, I you know uh, <laughs> made a change to the compiler to improve uh, situations like this um, so let me zoom in on the after this is the complete after error message so same thing before second argument of map has an un unexpected type. Uh, this convert types of file value is a and then you can see uh, here's the sort of like redacted record type we just have a dot 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 with all these fields that were just sort of omitted because they're the same in in the the two different types and we can now see much more easily um, that you know this depths uh, field in in the one record is a list uh, and then we'll ignore the type parameter there and then uh, in the other one it's a it's a dictionary and then the same thing with types by name it's a list in one and a dictionary in the other so this makes it a lot easier to see like oh, okay here's the actual problem here I just need to worry about these two fields all the other fields are the same so you know I, I don't need to see them um I still think this error message could be improved even further but I, again I wanted to give this as an, as an example of like sort of the value that we have around helpful error messages and and we're always trying to improve that um I mentioned earlier, like the language has a small number of simple primitives. Um, here's what they are. Uh, you have functions, which are in rock are anonymous lexical closures. That's the only way to make a function in rock is to write an anonymous lexical closure. Um, records are anonymous structural product types. So like structs in C, except you don't have to define them up front. Uh, they have structural types um, rather than nominal types. Uh, tag unions are also anonymous structural sum types. Uh, so if you've ever used uh, polymorphic variants in OCaml, they're very similar to that. Um, types are represented a little bit differently, but it's the same kind of idea. Um, opaque types, which are uh, nominal type wrappers. Uh, so for example, like stir, which is our string type, is a is sort of nominal uh, type. And um, and it's opaque in that you can't really see what the implementation is. It's like part of the standard library. And that's kind of the, uh, the way that you can define in user space your own nominal types is to say like, okay, I'm going to make this uh, nominal type. It's opaque within the context of my module, as long as I don't expose the implementation. Um, and then the in internal representation is going to be one of these other things like functions, records, tag unions, you know, some combination of, uh, of the other primitives. Um, and then finally, we have abilities, uh, which basically are a, a way to have uh, ad hoc polymorphism. Um, so for example, you can define your own eek or hash, like, like custom equals, custom hash. Uh, and then you can define for a particular opaque type, um, what does like double equals mean? You know, how, how is that implemented? Um, stuff like that. Build your own data structures, uh, all that good stuff. Um, I wanted to show like uh, briefly just a couple of examples of rock code. Um, this is, uh, I didn't write this code. This is um, somebody else's implementation of advent of code 2022. So just from about a month ago. Um, uh, so you can so briefly some things you can see. Uh, this is uh, our sort of like do notation equivalent for chaining together effects. So we have like task.await here on this like file.read utf8. This is the pipe operator. It's very popular. Um, it's a way to sort of chain uh, you know, function calls together. It's just sort of syntax sugar for uh, function calling with a, a different order. Um, we don't have a keyword like let. You can just do like inline definitions. Uh, you know, so this top level thing, uh, and then also these indented ones have uh, you know the indentation is significant here, and it means there's a different scope. Uh, we have string interpolation, which is backslash and open parens. So this is the same syntax that uh, Swift uses for string interpolation. And then we have pattern matching uh, using the when and is syntax. Um, so this is pattern matching on, on uh, parse error. And then this is pattern matching on underscore, which means like anything else. Um, this is our type annotation signature. Uh, sorry, our type annotation syntax. Um, so this is saying this part one uh, is a function that takes a list of pairs and then returns a nat, which is a natural number. I'll talk about the numbers a little bit later. This is our anonymous record syntax. Um, this is our anonymous uh, some types uh, syntax, the, the tag unions. Um, and then here's our anonymous uh, function syntax. So you can actually see all the different language primitives in this one small example. Uh, you might also notice that um, these two do not have uh, type annotations. So this is our sort of type inference at work. Um, even for top level values, you don't need to write type annotations and it's totally fine. Um, here's another example of someone else's advent of code uh, solving the, the same uh, thing. So they did choose to write a type annotation on main, which again, you don't have to, but they decided to. Um, and this person liked to use the pipe operator a lot more. So you can see there's like a lot of pipelines in here. And um, this is a pretty popular style that I've seen people use in Rock is to, is to write like really long uh, pipelines of, uh, of lots of things um, going in a row. Um, this also illustrates an example of uh, something that we don't do yet, but which I would love to do in the future, um, which is uh, deforestation, or, or maybe you've heard the term stream fusion, which is basically saying, okay, here we have two back-to-back -back calls to list.append. 
um, it would be great if uh, if we could sort of like uh, combine those together and just do like uh, sort of a, a combined operation. So like list.append, if it's doing it in place, which we'll talk about later, um, is going to do two separate bounds checks um, to see if uh, against the capacity to see if it needs to like reserve um, room for more space. Um, but we could condense that down into just uh, one and, and say like, oh, okay, well, we know we're about to append two things. So let's see if we can... Uh, like check the capacity to see if there's enough room for two different things. And if uh, if not, then we can just reserve that um, uh, in once and then and sort of save ourselves a conditional. A much more extreme example of the performance benefit we could get there would be if this was like two different list.maps, for example. Um, this is something that like Haskell can do. It can sort of combine those two into, into one operation um, automatically, but it's not something that Rock can do yet. So this is sort of like a, a future optimization that we would love to have. Um, okay, so that's sort of like the, the background motivation. Um, I want to talk through embedding before we get to performance. Um, so in, in Rock, we have this first class concept of platforms and applications. And there's like a distinction between those two. So let me explain what I mean by platforms and applications. So uh, in the general sense, when I, what I say when I mean a platform and application, um, here's an example of, of what I would consider to be a platform is uh, Django. So this is a, a Python framework for building web applications. Now, on top of that platform, there are multiple individual applications that are built using Django. So for example, Dropbox, uh, NASA uses Django, uh, the Onion uses Django. So they are each individually applications of this platform. Um, another example of a platform is like the Unity game engine. So there are many individual games built with Unity. So like Hearthstone, Untitled Goose Game, Monument Valley, these are all applications built on top of the Unity platform. Um, so in this, in this sense, you could think of a platform as something like a framework, although as we'll see later, uh, it's not just a framework. Um, in, in the scope of like what Rock talks about, platforms are, are capable of doing more than a framework like these or, or a game engine uh, is capable of doing. Um, now in Django, you have a Python-based API, uh, and it's talking to you know Dropbox and NASA and the Onion uh, you know, via Python. Um, and, uh, and in Unity, you have a C-sharp API, and, and all of these are written in C-sharp too. Um, but behind the scenes, like under the hood, Django is implemented in Python, whereas Unity is actually implemented in C++. So this is another important uh, aspect of platforms is that the public facing API that the applications see is not necessarily the same as what the platform is implemented in under the hood. So it's totally fine to say, you know, as is common in game engines that, yeah, okay, you can use this using our C-sharp API, but under the hood, it's C++ for performance reasons. Um, Okay, so let's say that I'm building a rock application. I am a rock application author. The experience that I'm going to have is number one, step one, pick a platform. So this is something that's unusual about rock is that you cannot build an application without picking a platform. You always have exactly one platform. There's no such thing as a rock application that's sort of platformless. That doesn't really make sense, as, as we'll see later. Um, you always have to start by picking a platform. So for example, uh, here's how I would define that in, in syntax. I would say, okay, I'm going to uh, have my as my platform this unsandboxed CLI, or perhaps I might choose a sandbox CLI platform. Those two platforms might be different ways to write a CLI, one of them being sandboxed, and I'll explain what I mean by that later, and the other one being unsandboxed. Um, Step two, once I picked a platform, I need to sort of learn that platform's API so I understand how to use it properly. And then finally, I can build an application on it. Now, the Rock platform author experience is totally different. So, okay, first I have to pick a name for my platform so that you know applications can refer to it. So let's say I choose basic CLI, for example, that's the name of, a, of an existing Rock platform that, that's like a real one. Um, then I have to define an API. So this is like the Rock API that application authors are going to see. But then I need to implement what's called the host. And the host part of the platform is the sort of uh, low level part, like in, in Unity, this would be the C++ part. So every Rock platform has both a public API that's uh, used by application authors that's written in Rock, and then also a host that is not written in Rock, which is written in some lower level language. Um, so like Rust or C++ or Zig or C or whatever you want. Um, but importantly, as the Rock platform author, this is part of your responsibility is to implement these uh, th this low level primitive. Um, so going back to the Django and Unity comparison, um, let's say I was building a web server platform in Rock and I had a Rock API for that. Um, I might choose to use Rust under the hood to implement uh, the, the, the primitives, uh, like the low level primitives. Or I'm building this sandbox CLI, again, public facing Rock API, uh, but under the hood, maybe it's SIG. Um, so this is how it is in Rock. Uh, you don't see the Django thing. It's it's much more of the sort of Unity example where the low level thing is, uh, sorry, behind the scenes under the hood, it's always going to be a different language than Rock. Okay, 
So um, if I'm a Rock application author, this means I only write Rock code. Like the fact that I'm building on a platform that has this low level implementation is completely invisible to me. I have no idea what my platform is written in unless I decide to go, you know, look at the source code and like see what's going on under the hood. Um, but much like Unity, I, I don't need to care. I don't need to know C++. All I need to know is Rock. So in that way, being an application author for Rock feels a lot like uh, you know, I'm writing Python, for example. I'm, I'm using most high-level languages. Uh, I do have to pick a platform, but in practice, it's pretty common to pick some sort of framework like Django or or something like that um, in a lot of programming languages these days anyway. Um, now, for Rock platform authors, I'm not just writing Rock code. I need to write both Rock code and lower-level code. So this means that not every per Rock programmer is going to decide to become a platform author. You know, you don't have to. You can just be totally happy only writing Rock applications, um, which is how I kind of expect most people to use the language. Uh, but if you want to, you can get into platform development too and, uh, and you know, sort of venture outside the comfort zone of just writing Rock code. Okay, so I mentioned these target use cases earlier, um, servers, CLIs, native ULIs, uh, UIs, um, and then some sort of like more esoteric use cases like editor plugins, database extensions, and embedding into an existing code base. Um, so for example, uh, of these like target use cases, I might say, okay, we're gonna have a web server platform. So somebody implements their vision of a web server platform. And just like you can have multiple web server frameworks, like Django is not the only way you can build web servers in Python, um, you can have multiple web server platforms. Anyone can write one, implement it however they want. Um, one person might make a, you know, this rock API, another person might make a slightly different rock API. Um, and also one of them might implement the low level stuff in Rust, another one might implement low level stuff in C. No problem, all of those are totally valid. Um, and similarly, for, for these other use cases, like editor plugins and database extensions, someone might write a platform for PostgreSQL extensions. So this is a good example of where that low-level piece can be, come in really handy. This is where they would write, let's say, in, using C, uh, the low-level bindings to Postgres, and then they would expose a pure Rock API. And so now, anyone using that platform, again, as an application author, my application might be you know, a Postgres extension, I don't have to learn about PostgreSQL's like C API for talking to the database. I'm just like, oh, well, here's a nice little rock platform for me to build on. This as a rock programmer is totally normal for me. But now instead of writing a command line app, I'm just writing a database extension, but it wasn't any more work for me than it was to write a CLI. It, it was just like, oh, I have to just go learn my platform's API. And now I'm writing a Postgres extension in rock. Um, and then finally, uh, it, taking that metaphor a step further, I can use this sort of platforms and applications architecture to embed into an existing code base. So let's say I am writing a bunch of C++ because I'm writing a, a whole game in C++, and I want to just use Rock as a little scripting language. This is something that game developers very commonly use Lua for. Um, you can use Rock for this instead, and the runtime performance should be a lot faster than Lua, uh, which is certainly something that the game programmers tend to care about. So if I have a use case where you know I, I don't need absolute maximum performance, I don't need to write it in C++, and I want to be able to develop faster because like the rock compiler is faster and it's got automatic memory management. Um, you know, I, I want all, as much performance as I can get, but I don't need that sort of maximum level. Um, I can make my own entire C++ game be the platform and then uh, just write a little uh, rock application on top of that. So this platforms and applications uh, system works for all these different use cases. And this is how things are done in rock. Okay. So I mentioned earlier this idea of like, okay, you can have an unsandboxed CLI platform. Um, so uh, sandboxing uh, is, is something that's accomplished by the fact that in Rock, all IO primitives are defined in the platform. So there are there is zero IO operations in Rock standard library. It's just not a thing. It's, it's just all data structures. Um, so whatever platform you pick, that platform is going to expose to you whatever IO primitives you have access to. And that's the only way you have access to IO primitives. Now, one of the cool things about this is that it means, for example, that you, uh, as a platform author, can decide not to expose I.O. primitives that don't make sense in the context of what your platform is doing. So, for example, in a database extension platform, maybe you don't want to expose arbitrary file system access. That, does that make sense if you're writing a database extension? Is that a good thing to expose? Maybe, maybe not. But the point is, as the platform author, you have control over that which in turn means that if you're building a platform for database extensions in Rock, you can create guarantees using that. You can say, for example, anyone who writes a database extension in Rock on top of this platform cannot possibly write to the file system because I, as the platform author, have not given them the ability to do that. And in Rock, there's no, there's no way around that. There's no like arbitrary CFFI that you can use as a backdoor. It's literally all the IO primitives you get come from the platform. If the platform does not expose that IO primitive, there is no way to get access to it. So this is a really cool security feature. So let's say I have this unsandboxed CLI. 
and I want to swap it out for this other platform called Sandbox CLI. And let's say those two platforms have identical Rock APIs, but different under the hood implementations. Like for example, the Sandbox CLI could do stuff like web browsers do that sort of sandbox uh, potentially dangerous IO operations. So this could be really cool for as a way to distribute scripts where I can say, oh, I have received this Rock script that I downloaded off the internet. I'm not going to audit the entire thing because let's be honest, when we download scripts from the internet, I mean, who among us actually reads the entire code of the script to try to see if it's doing something malicious? Um, well, in this world, I potentially don't have to. If, if I see that it's using a platform that I'm familiar with called, let's say, Sandbox CLI, and I know that that platform is going to do what web browsers do and say, hey, uh, I want to prompt you if this script is trying to access you know, certain directories on your file system, if it's trying to do reads in a certain place, if it's trying to do writes in a certain place, the script author has no control over the fact that the platform is going to stop and prompt me as the user and say, hey, this script that you're running right now is trying to access slash Etsy slash password. Do you want to allow that? Why slash N? The script author cannot get around that because again, this sandbox CLI platform doesn't give them the ability to get, get around that. It just only offers primitives that are sandboxed in this way. So I would love this as a, as a user of scripts like this, because I could have so much more trust in them than I do like today's uh, scripts in, in most programming languages where, you know, they, they just have complete untrusted access. They can do whatever they want to my machine. Um, and, and I don't have uh, any recourse other than just like, auditing the whole thing, which I don't really want to spend my time doing. Um, so this sort of sandbox scripting thing is, is a really cool use case of the platforms and applications thing um, that, that I, I would be really excited to use to be able to run untrusted code without fear. Um, so you can imagine like there's, there's lots of other things you can do with this, but this is just one example of the sort of security guarantees there. Now, another thing in Rock is that all heap memory management is done by the platform. Um, so basically there's, there's a set of uh, memory management primitives that the low level language like C++ or Rust is responsible for implementing. So you have Rock alloc, which is basically malloc, Rock dealloc, which is basically free, and Rock realloc, which is basically realloc. And the Rock application uh, will compile down to calls to these and that's it. There's so Rock does not have a stateful garbage collector. It doesn't have a, a like a tracing memory management. It's basically just, hey, uh, platform, I'm going to make you in charge of what you want to do for heap allocations and deallocations um, as far as the actual implementation of that, uh, which un unlocks some pretty cool things that we'll talk about in the performance section. Um, so uh, so Java, you know, has a tracing garbage collector. It's tunable in user space. Swift uses automatic reference counting. So that means you don't have long GC pauses, uh, but it does mean that you have lower throughput. Um, the Apache web server uh, has is an interesting example of domain specific memory management where they actually offer arena allocation, um, which is really fast and has high throughput, but it does have the downside that it's domain specific. So basically what, what they offer you to do is to have um, every single web request gets its own arena and it just allocates into that arena for the duration of the web request and then once the request is done and it's sent the response back, it just deallocates everything all at once. Um, or, but in fact, doesn't really need to deallocate. It can just sort of like reuse that existing arena buffer uh, for you know a future request that comes in. So this is super fast, but it's not something that you can do for sort of any old program. It only works because you have this sort of like domain specific use case of web servers that happen to have like a long chunk of code uh, that's, that's being run in the duration of this web request where you know that at the end of it, everything could be free. So one of the cool things about Rock is that the platform author can sort of totally choose, um, you know, what they want to do in terms of memory management. So we do offer automatic reference counting by default. Um, you, can, you can also leak if you want. So this is actually useful for like scripts. You can say like, you know, I'm, I'm just going to not deallocate anything over the course of the entire script. Just implement Rock dealloc as a no-op um, because you know what? Once the script's done, we're just going to let the operating system clean it all up. So we can just save time not bothering to um, deallocate things along the way. And in fact, we can even do arena allocation. So this is um, not something that we've actually implemented yet, but um, we know from a design perspective, it's already possible today to do this, to basically do the same thing that Apache does with arena allocation on a per web request basis um, that does not free the memory until the end of the web request. Uh, so I don't know of any other language that, that makes it easy to do this, uh, but in Rock, this is very straightforward. It's just something that the platform author does. And then as application author, this is all totally transparent to you. It's just, you know, again, feels like I'm just using a framework, um, but behind the scenes, it can do all these really cool memory management things. Um, also, this uh, enables like better memory observability uh, because again, since the platform uh, is in charge of every single allocation, it's really easy to put hooks in and say, oh, you know, every time an allocation happens, every time a deallocation happens, I can sort of record the context of that and then provide that uh, to whoever's like reading the logs of the server. Um, okay, so... 
that's sort of platforms and applications and how you can use them to embed rock and other things. Um, let's 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 sort of get to the meat of this and talk about uh, performance. Um, so we talked about uh, domain specific memory management um, previously. So um, here's uh, the, like those three primitives. There's also rock mem copy and mem set, but they're not that uh, important. The critical thing here is that this is all transparent to application authors. So uh, allocation strategies for command line platform might be, I might choose to do standard malloc and free with the automatic ref counting that the compiler inserts. Um, I could also implement a custom malloc so I could use uh, you know, any of these alternative mallocs to the one that comes in the C standard library. Um, I can also decide to just never free, just do a big mmap up front, turn off reference counting, and then just say, you know what, uh, from now on, I'm just gonna leak memory the entire program and, and let it uh, get cleaned up by the OS when it exits. Um, a web server might do something totally different. So they might, again, choose to do malloc and free with automatic ref counting, totally fine. Um, might do arena allocation per HTTP request handler, like we talked about. Um, and then also that might do a combination of things and say like, well, certain long lived connections, like for example, databases, uh, database connections, maybe we don't want to free those at all. We just keep those running as long as the server's running um, and don't even you know bother to, to attempt to garbage collect them. Um, so uh, that's sort of like the domain specific memory management aspect, but there's more to rock than just that, uh, that sort of like platforms and applications uh, uh, performance optimization stuff. We also have some like basic strategies for making the compiled code run fast. Essentially, we say, okay, in order to achieve our ergonomics goals, like um, as, a, as a high level language with automatic memory management, what we're going to sacrifice is control. Like we don't let you access raw pointers. We don't let you do your own me uh, memory management inside the application. That's just a platform thing. Um, but uh, we, we still try to avoid features that have high runtime costs. So uh, things like you know dynamic typing and things like that, where just, it's just absolutely required that you keep around extra stuff in memory. We really try to minimize memory usage uh, to the extent possible and also uh, minimize CPU usage for any given feature that we're implementing in the language. Um, one way you can think of the way that Rock compiles is we're sort of like having the compiled output of like a restricted C++ subset. Um, so as some examples of this, uh, we have records, tag unions, and functions. Records are our anonymous product types, which basically compile down to C structs. There's no extra overhead there. Um, here's an example of that syntactically, this will just compile down to a C struct. Um, Tag unions are our anonymous subtypes. And again, these, uh, sorry, some types, these uh, basically compile to C tagged unions. Uh, so a union that has like one uh, slot in it reserved for the discriminant, um, and then the rest of it is just a C union. Um, so as an example of this, uh, you can just define these on the right, on the fly by just making a, a term that has a capital letter uh, that just creates a tag. And then you can just sort of, uh, you know, pattern match on them or use them in conditionals or whatever. Um, and we do have pattern matching with uh, exhaustiveness checking on these. Um, functions are anonymous stack allocated lexical closures. So again, like C++ lambdas, um, you know, we have, this is actually one of the most complicated parts of the compiler is, is to be able to uh, compile all these things down um, to stack allocated stuff and figure out how much space do we need to allocate, especially if you have like a list of functions, for example, um, without doing a heap allocation for, for each uh, closure, which is the norm in, in basically every other <laughs> um, uh, automatic memory management language I'm aware of. Um, Anyway, uh, okay, so number types, uh, very straightforward. Um, we just have sort of like, you know, 8-bit, uh, 16-bit, 32-bit, 64-bit, 128-bit integers. Uh, these are all signed integers. We also have unsigned integers for all of those, um, as well as uh, NAT, which is kind of like U size and Rust or uh, U and pointer T in, in uh, C or C++. Um, then we have floats. Uh, so 32-bit floats, 64-bit floats. Then we also have a uh, fixed point decimal type, um, which is not as fast as floats because it doesn't have hardware acceleration, but it does have a nice property that... <laughs> 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 is actually 0 0.3, unlike floats. Um, for strings, uh, well, again, sort of aiming for a compiled output of a restricted C++, um, you know, we have normal looking string literals. Um, under the hood, they basically look like uh, sort of like the, the same uh, representation you'll see in C++. So you have um, the content, which is just a bunch of bytes. You have length and a capacity, uh, 24 bytes total on a 64-bit on a, um, machine. Um, but we do this small string optimization, which is that basically if you have a string that is under 24 bytes, uh, we will actually store that in line in this struct and use the last byte to store the length. Um, and, and there won't be a heap allocation at all. So actually, uh, if you write this string, hello world, well, okay, this would actually get compiled into the static section of the binary anyway. Anyway, um, but if you like dynamically created this string hello world by appending two smaller strings together, it would not actually heap allocate because this is under 24 uh, bytes on, on a 64-bit machine. Um, so it would just uh, compile down to this struct and then everything would be stored in line. Uh, so C++ does this too. Um, 
So uh, arrays, um, we, we call them lists, but uh, they're basically the same thing. This is like part of the standard library. Um, so you can think of it as like, it's they're all just like a, a reference counted uh, C++ std vector. Um, so here's the syntax for it. It looks like kind of like a list and like an ML family language. Um, again, it's kind of the same structure as, as a, um, as a string, except that you know we're, we're pointing to this content, which could be a byte or it could be you know something else, depending on what the uh, the list is parameterized on. Um, there is no small list optimization. However, Rock does have a monomorphizing compiler, so this could be a pointer to all sorts of different things, uh, depending on what you're compiling to. There is no runtime overhead for uh, polymorphism across lists. Um, so, brief summary of uh, how we make the standard library fast. Numbers have no memory overhead. They're they're exactly the same representation as you see in like C or C plus uh, plus. With that said, we do actually um, panic on in integer overflow um, by default. You can opt out of that if you want to, and just like say explicitly, I want to do wrapping arithmetic. But that's not the default. Like if you use plus, you will get panicking overflow because that seems like the right trade off to make for a, a language like Rock. Um, uh, the way that panics work, uh, this is not like a try catch exception thing. It's basically like the the platform defines what happens if a panic occurs. Um, List basically works like a ref counted C plus plus std vector. String works like a ref counted C plus plus std string, including the uh, small string optimization. And um, basically, so you know, in summary, like the main overhead of Rock compared to C plus plus is the default reference counting, plus some really minor stuff like integer overflow panicking by default. But again, you can you can opt out of that if you want to. Uh, but other than that, I mean, this is kind of what I mean when we say like we're really trying to compile down to a sort of like restricted subset of C++, although we're not literally compiling to C++, we're compiling to machine code via LLVM, which is the same thing that uh, you know, like Clang++ uses. Um, one of the note is uh, reference cycles. Um, so this is something that people often ask me about with uh, when I say that Rock uses automatic reference counting, which we do. There is no tracing garbage collection in Rock. Um, you know, how do you detect reference cycles? Well, fortunately, in pure functional programming, uh, there are no side effects, only managed effects, uh, which means that um, you know if there's no mutation, everything is immutable. Then there's no way to define a reference cycle in Rock. That's just not a thing. You can't. You cannot write code in Rock that creates a reference cycle. Um, so we just don't have to collect them. Uh, this is one of several really nice upsides for pure functional programming, uh, but it is one of the rare examples of pure functional programming making things faster. Um, speaking of which, the fact that we have no mutation is by default uh, certainly a big concern in terms of performance because some algorithms just require in-place mutation in order to run fast. Um, so a, a reasonable question that people would ask is like, okay, so how competitive can a pure functional language be at a mutation heavy algorithm such as quicksort, for example? Um, so I gave a whole talk at Strange Loop a couple of years ago about this example, but I'm going to kind of go through it briefly. Um, this is a benchmark that we did uh, to compare basically like sort of textbook unoptimized quicksort uh, across a couple of different languages, including Rock. Um, this is a pretty silly benchmark, I have to admit, because nobody writes like handwritten, like unoptimized quicksort from scratch in different languages. But I picked it because, uh, as you can see, if you're, if you're familiar with quicksort, I mean, this is like the JavaScript or part of the JavaScript implementation, like we're doing for loops. We're uh, calling swap and and uh, you know in, uh, which does in-place mutation. Uh, we're, we're incrementing this counter. Um, you know, here's another in-place mutation. Like Quicksort is just full of in-place mutations. Um, you can implement Quicksort uh, in, in like uh, Haskell, for example. Um, here's the like the, the way that people often uh, say like, oh look, this is like a very concise, very elegant Quicksort in Haskell. Um, the only problem with this is that this is in no sense of the word Quicksort. Uh, it has none of the characteristics of Quicksort that make it quick. Uh, this is just like an algorithm that you know someone wrote that uh, yeah it does some sorting, but I I don't see how you could really call this Quicksort because what's going on under the hood has nothing to do with Quicksort, and that's kind of the whole point of the algorithm. Um, now, someone actually wrote a blog post about, uh, well, that fact, <laughs> but also uh, they sort of implemented like, what is a real quicksort in Haskell that's actually doing the, the quicksort, uh, you know, algorithm, um, it, you know, at runtime? What does that look like? And it's a lot longer. Uh, and also it's using all sorts of unsafe things, um, including unsafe slice, which is basically using a mutable vector because you can't actually do that in Haskell. There, it's not required that everything is immutable, um, which doesn't perform balance checks. So basically, if you want to really do quicksort in Haskell, um, you know, the, sort of the real way you can do it this way, but this implementation is imperative and memory unsafe. Um, but to be fair, uh, it is actually pretty fast. So here's like um, uh, quick sorting uh, 10 million unsorted uh, uh, numbers. Um, the Haskell one is actually like a little bit faster than JavaScript, not quite as fast as Java uh, or Go or C++, um, but still pretty impressive for a pure functional language. So in Haskell, if you want to, if you really need an algorithm like this, you can sort of venture into the danger zone and pull out the uh, the unsafe imperative tools and get get something that is fast. Um, 
Now, so this is all again the same algorithm, just like you know, different uh, overheads, uh, sort of explaining the differences in uh, in performance between these two, uh, between these different languages. Now, what Rock does is something called opportunistic mutation. So basically, um, if you're familiar with the uh, functional but in place, uh, this is what you see in like the Coca and Perseus literature around this technique. But essentially, the idea is that so we do reference counting. If the reference count is one at runtime when we're about to do an operation. Uh, like, for example, like a list.set where we would, uh, you know, say like, I want to change this, you know, the nth element of a, of a, of a list. Um, if the reference count of that list is one, right when we're doing that, we can say, you know what, mutation would be totally unobservable. We know from the fact that the reference count is one, that this is the only copy of this list that exists. So yeah, we could clone it and make a new list that has that one change in place. But I mean, why bother doing that when we could just mutate in place and just return the original one that you passed in because nobody else is going to ever see that. This is just a performance optimization with no downside in terms of semantics. Um, now, granted, if the reference count is not one, then you do need to clone the data structure, obviously, if you want to preserve the sort of semantic immutability of the code. Um, but that's fine. So basically, like this is what Rock does, is when uh, it would be unobservable to do an in-place mutation, the compiler just does it. Um, and if it, if it would be observable to mutate in place, then we don't do it. We just clone it. And so all the APIs look like they are pure functional and, and immutable and semantically they are immutable um but whenever it would be unobservable to you know sort of opportunistically use mutation uh, it just sort of silently does that now i mentioned like reference count being one there's actually as i will talk about in a second um there are ways that we can sort of statically detect this and not rely on the reference count at runtime um but uh this is sort of like the, the basic idea is to detect somehow that a mutation would be unobservable and therefore use mutation so the semantic immutability is preserved but we still get the runtime performance of mutation uh, when we need it. Um, so this static in place detection, the first version that we uh, implemented, uh, Folker DeVries did this um, as, as part of his master's thesis at, I'm gonna butcher this, I'm so sorry, I'm an American. I, I would call this Radboud University. I know that's not how it's pronounced, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, if, if you're Dutch, I, I apologize. Um, <laughs> but basically he did a, a version of this using uniqueness types. And then uh, he ran into William Brandon at a conference um, who introduced us to the Morphic Solver, which is a, 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 um, a a system that uh, a group of researchers at uh, UC Berkeley had come up with for uh, doing the same thing via alias analysis, which uh, had a bunch of solved a bunch of problems that we were having with the uh, uniqueness um, typing approach. Um, so shout out to them. This this was great. Um, so uh, with that, oh yeah, by the way, this is uh, if you want to learn more about Morphic Solver, uh, here's William's uh, contact info. Um, so uh, here's all of our like you know in in place mutationy heavy uh, JavaScript. Um, here's like the the sort of corresponding rock code where again we don't have any mutation primitives. I just you know we wrote this using sort of normal uh, functional programming style like pure functions and recursion. Um, so we're we're using this record to record like the the two different things which we didn't see in the JavaScript version. Um, we are uh, returning that in both branches of this conditional, and then we are calling partition help, which is this other function that uh, also returns more records, and then um, <laughs> and then like recurses on itself. Um, so if you put these side by side, it's like obviously the rock version has to do a lot more work, and that's because like let's be honest. Quicksort is kind of a pathological algorithm for pure functional programming. It's it's sort of you know, designed to be done in a very imperative style. Um, and we're just sort of, you know, we, we chose Quicksort as an example because we wanted to see how well we could do, even though in terms of performance, even though this is sort of pathological um, and and sort of like see, okay, how, how good are our optimizations? Um, you know, how can we do, even when we're not cheating and using the sort of like, you know, introducing uh, like mutation unsafe uh, APIs like, like we had to do in Haskell to get it to be fast enough. Um, so here was the, uh, the comparison of like, you know, with, uh, Haskell and like the, the cheating version, <laughs> um, when I introduced rock to this list, um, it turns out we did extremely well. Um, it was faster than all the imperative languages and the like cheating Haskell implementation. Um, and, and the only one that was faster than it was C++. And, uh, <laughs> We actually have some ideas about how to get it even closer. I don't think we can quite get it all the way uh, to catch up with C++. Um, but basically, this has sort of been our, our prototype for like um, how we like to think about um, performance in Rock. Um, we haven't done any other benchmarks of this scale because, to be honest, it actually like took a significant amount of time to like write the quicksort implementation of all these languages in a way that seemed fair and reasonable. Um, like, for example, we, we learned partway through that we needed to use uh, doubles rather than 64-bit integers because that really heavily penalized JavaScript, um, things like that. Uh, but anyway... Um, at the end of the day, uh, we, we're really happy with how this performance turned out on this benchmark. And subsequently, the, the way that we've approached things is to say, okay, how much slower are we than like C++ or Rust? And how can we sort of close that gap? But we're always sort of aiming to be as close as possible to systems level languages, rather than saying, oh, well, we're a little bit slower than Java, and that's okay. It's like, no, we really want to try and approach like asymptotically approach 
um, systems level languages in terms of performance. Um, so the way, again, the way that we achieve this result is unbox monomorphize values, um, static reference counting uh, to the extent possible, um, uh, tail call optimization, uh, LLVM optimizations. Um, uh, so tail, tail call optimization, of course, is necessary <laughs> for all that uh, recursion to get optimized into a, into a while loop. Um, and then finally, uh, opportunistic in-place mutation. Um, okay. Finally, I want to just uh, sort of uh, close out by talking about um, our sort of aspirations for the editor that we want to, to build with Rock. Um, basically, the, like, the way that I see it, um, developer tools are multipliers. So back in the day, we had things like teletypes and, uh, you know, <laughs> developing uh, on a teletype was very, very slow. Uh, but then we sort of like improved uh, over, over the time, over time and got things like IDEs. Um, and, you know, that's great. There's, there's some percentage improvement of productivity when you go from working on a teletype to, uh, to working in an IDE. However, you know, productive you can be on a teletype, you can be some percentage more productive in an IDE. Um, so uh, then, you know, the, the natural question that, uh, that I think this raises is, what's the next thing after that? Like, what is, how do you improve on an IDE and say, like, let's get X percent even better uh, than that? Like, what goes in that sort of next evolutionary step box? Um, that, that, you know, gets us up to like plus Y percent on top of that X percent. Um, so to me, I, I think, uh, to answer this question, we should look at like, you know, what does it mean to create developer tools in 2023? Well, it very often requires uncommon expertise. It often is uh, too time consuming to justify. A lot of people don't bother building their own developer tools. They just use tools that other people created. Um, and also, you know, even if they do create something, uh, there's often friction to share it with others. Like if you try to make an editor extension uh, for like, you know, Vim, that is not going to work. And if for somebody who's using Emacs or VS code or something like that, uh, likewise, if you create an extension for one of those other things, it's not going to work there. Um, you know, there's just a lot of friction all around to trying to like create new developer tools to improve people's productivity. Now, in contrast, if I look at like how easy it is to create a function, it's a piece of cake. It's common expertise. Like any programming language you're, you're writing in, you're going to know how to create functions. Um, they take very little time to implement. Uh, and, and it's trivial to share them with others using package managers. If I write you know, a, a series of very elaborate functions, it's really easy for me to share those with other people using a package manager. Um, so the, the question that, that we're trying to ask with Rock, among others, is what if creating developer tools could be as easy as creating functions? Like it just takes you about the same amount of time to write an editor extension as it does to write a function in code. Um, so in other words, imagine if creating multipliers, you know, things like refactor rename, which is certainly a, you know, a plus X percent uh, uh, multiplier, but you were doing it sort of like domain specifically for either a platform or maybe even just a particular library. Um, what if this was something that just required only common expertise and took very little time to implement and then was trivial to share with others? And when I say trivial to share with others, I specifically mean through the package ecosystem. Like you can write a developer extension for an editor using only the knowledge that you have to use the programming language in, gen in general. It's as easy as writing a function. And then you can share it just using the normal package manager with no extra overhead of getting into like an extension marketplace or anything like that. Um, well, in that world, we could say, okay, here's someone who's got, you know, plus X percent, and then they got plus Y percent from, uh, you know, using uh, their, this extension that they wrote for, uh, for the editor. Maybe they write another extension that, you know, boosts their own productivity because um, they're, they're just like, oh, this is so easy. I can just knock out these things really quickly uh, to, to help myself get better. But because of the sharing aspect, you know, you've got these other people who are, they're collaborating with, maybe using the same kinds of libraries and the same kinds of platforms um, they're using. And now if the, if the distribution is really easy where the, the plugins can be shipped with the packages and not have to be coupled to uh, like an editor, like um, uh, extension marketplace that's sort of completely separate from the package that they're distributing. Like what if you could say, I'm going to write my package like for, I don't know, parsing dates or, or regular expressions or something like that. Um, and inside that package, there is built-in editor tooling that you get inside your editor just from installing that package. Well, now this X percent is applied to everybody else who's using that same uh, that same package. And you know, same thing with that Y percent, that Z percent. And even better, somebody else writes their own tooling and you know for their own use case, and that gets shared with everybody else. And pretty soon we have this sort of like exponential explosion of in every individual, because it's become so easy to create and distribute your own developer tooling for your own productivity improvements, that it benefits everybody else. And, and it can create uh, something that's way more than the sum of its parts. So that's what we want to go for with the, the Rock Editor. So this is an editor that um, I don't have a demo of it because it's very, very basic at this point. It's like really, really early days. Um, but, uh, but the goal is to ship with Rock an editor that is super easy to write extensions for in Rock. Uh, they'll run really fast because Rock runs really fast. 
they'll be sandboxed. So you don't have to worry about the fact that you're just, whenever you install a package, you're getting editor tooling with it. Because again, with, uh, similar to that sandbox CLI example I talked about earlier, um, we can totally sandbox all those things. That's something that Rock is also really good at. Um, and because of all those things put together uh, and, and some design work that we've done to make it really easy to write these things, as easy as writing a function, uh, you can just write these right there alongside your code. Like literally you write a function, then press enter, and then immediately start writing code for an editor extension uh, that, that's you know in that same module. Um, <laughs> no extra overhead. Um, using this, we think that there's this, this great potential to have this sort of virtuous cycle of like a, a self-reinforcing feedback loop where everybody becomes not just a programmer that can multiply their own productivity, but also everybody else's who's sharing their code. Um, so in other words, what if we could take these things that we have today, the, the library ecosystem and a tooling ecosystem and combine them? I think that has huge potential and it's worth scratch building a high performance editor to get that. Um, but like I said, early days for that. Uh, but I know this is a community that has a lot of people who care about things like structured editing, which we do too. Um, so I wanted to mention it because I think uh, it's, a, it's a really exciting um, project with a lot of really cool prospects. Um, so, um, you know, why a, a focus editor? Like, why not just uh, write a VS code extension or something like that? Um, basically, I think mainstream IDEs today have uh, broad scopes that make developer tools harder to create, like VS code, Vim, Emacs. They all have very broad scopes. They're trying to target lots of different languages. Um, and that means that they, you end up with sort of like a co lowest common denominator, like, you know, language server protocol um, that, that, in my opinion, makes dev tools a lot harder to create than what we can do if we're building a focused language specific editor like people used to make in the old days, like with Smalltalk and things like that. Um, also, I think mainstream languages today have designs that make dev tools a lot harder to create. Um, you know, if you're writing a pure functional language, um, you know, without going into a lot of details on this, uh, there's just certain things that become a lot easier when you have those uh, guarantees in place in terms of being able to, uh, to write developer tooling. So basically, Rock is a, a language that has been designed with tool creation in mind. This platforms and applications thing and this runtime performance focus is actually in large part in support of this goal that we have of making a really great editor where lots of people are writing plugins in Rock really easily. And because Rock runs really fast, those editor plugins can run really fast. Um, and because uh, we, we've got the sandboxing from the platforms and applications where the, the plugins are an application and the editor is a platform, uh, there aren't security concerns about distributing them really seamlessly through the package ecosystem. Um, so basically, this is why we're, we're working on building our own editor is that we want to realize this vision of, of being able to create this really great, like virtuous cycle, um, you know, uh, exponential feedback loop. Um, okay, finally, I want to just talk about some progress on all these things. Editor progress right now, it's really at sort of like the basic proof of concept level. There's like a little bit of like basic type checking. You can like uh, highlight things and it'll tell you what type it has because it's, uh, it's integrated with the compiler. Editor, like the compiler is written in Rust. Um, we're doing like direct to GPU rendering because again, we're, we're really performance focused here. We want it to be as fast as possible. So there's no Electron here. There's no um, uh, there's no Java. This is nothing. It's just like Rust, direct to GPU. We've got our own shaders and stuff like that. Um, that's that's you know the, the level that we're going out aiming for per performance wise. Um, and of course it's integrated in the compiler. So the type, type reference and type checking that we have uh, right now is actually directly sharing code with the Rock compiler. Um, development of the language as a whole. Uh, so we have 128 total to contributors so far as of this morning, which is a, a nice round number. So I was pretty pleased to see that. Um, there's the, really though, it's like there's like 10 main contributors that you know uh, contribute on a, on a regular basis, um, and everybody else is sort of like you know a much smaller number of commits as is normal for open source projects. Um, four people today are paid to work uh, at least part time on Rock. Um, and uh, we're really happy to help new contributors uh, get onboarded. So if anyone who's listening to this uh, is interested in getting involved in Rock's development, um, please let me know because we, we would love to have you. Um, in terms of research, uh, this is not an academic language. It's not uh, a research language. Um, this is uh, designed to be used in industry. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited to start working on uh, getting it adopted at the company that I'm about to start at, uh, which is called Vendor, V-E-N-D-R. Um, and uh, we're, we're really excited about like using Rock to actually like power uh, Vendor itself, the product. Um, but having said that, um, there has been one master's thesis and a paper written that was uh, the fulcrates um, on the uh, uniqueness typing approach that we ended up moving away from. Um, there's one thesis in progress, uh, which I uh, will be excited to talk about that once it's actually out there. Um, and we actually have a, a document of like um, different like research projects, uh, ideas that, um, you know, potential, uh, you know, if someone's looking for uh, like a research project to do or like a, a thesis or something like that, um, uh, we would love to work with uh, any researchers who are interested in like uh, working on rock. And here's some ideas uh, for, for potentially cool projects. Um, 
but of course that's that's not exhaustive. All right. Um, so to summarize all the things we talked about, um, so target use cases for Rock, things like you know big use cases like servers, CLIs, native UIs. Also, sort of like the long tail of uh, of applications, uh, sorry, of domains like editor plugins, database extensions, um, and finally just embedding into any existing code base, like your you know C plus plus game, um, targeting fast compilation, you know, like uh, fast runtime performance, helpful compiler error messages. Um, the language is designed around a small number of simple primitives, and uh, of course, for it to be easy to embed into existing code bases. Um, in terms of compilation speed, you know, we're, we're really happy that like, you know, hello world, uh, this is with the, uh, the surgical linker. So this is done on Linux. Um, it was almost as fast as Python and, and faster than things like Node.js and Clang and Go. Um, uh, in terms of like runtime performance, uh, again, like approaching that sort of systems level of pro uh, programming language performance without quite hitting it because we do have automatic memory management. Um, but, you know, uh, we're, we're really proud of like how fast we'd be able to get, get the runtime performance because of things like unboxed monomorphized values, LLVM as a backend, um, static reference counting, opportunistic in-place mutation. And of course, this is all without getting into the domain-specific memory management stuff like, uh, like we can do on web servers with arena allocation and stuff like that. Um, and then finally, of course, the editor where like the goal is to create that the creating editor plugins is as easy as creating functions and distributing them is that easy too. So uh, if you're interested in any of uh, the stuff that we, uh, I've talked about um, and you want to get involved, uh, here are some ways to do that. We have a Zulip chat, um, lots of friendly people. Uh, and also, if you're not even interested in getting involved, just want to try out the language, uh, this is a good place to do it. Um, there's a beginner's channel, lots of people uh, happy there to help you get up and running. Uh, or if you you know would rather just uh, send me an email, that's also cool. Uh, rock at rtfeldman.com. Um, happy to chat. Okay, uh, thanks very much. And uh, I, we have a few minutes left for questions, but not many. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, happy to, to answer. Uh, and, and if people want to run over, uh, we can do that too. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much. This has been amazing. I will now stop the recording so we can have the Q&A in private. So this is uh, things we do. So for people watching the video next time, if you want to participate in the Q&A, you have just to join us live.